took fire this morning from the schoolhouse to the west. How come? Let's go. If there's one thing that I learned and appreciated about uh, the, the soldiers of the 101st that I didn't know from research and from studying history is just how tough these people are. The 101st is an aerial assault division, the only one like it in the world, capable of taking a brigade-sized force deep behind enemy lines in helicopters in a matter of hours and taking with them a lot of firepower. The Screaming Eagles is their nickname, and the basic theory behind the nickname and that motto is fierce and, and ready for battle, and that's the way they consider themselves. Moving! Pick it up! These were the door kickers. These were the guys that, if anybody was going to be seeing exciting, interesting stuff, it was going to be these guys. They are a very mobile division, the most mobile, in fact, uh, in the world and they were designed to be able to what they call assault into an area very quickly with quite a bit of firepower. Imagine the battlefield is a chessboard. Imagine the 101st is the knight able to rapidly bypass or even fly over their own units as well as enemy units. That gives you some idea of how they're being used. They have some vehicles that they use, but mainly, as I learned uh, to my aching back when I was carrying a lot of camera gear in, in my backpack, they they walk. The officers that we were with really got to be friends of ours. Colonel Brooke was super smart. I mean, he's got a PhD in physics and he's an extraordinary commander. I think Colonel Brooke would find a bed of nails kind of a comfortable place to lie down. Man, yet at the same time, totally respected and really loved. Major Kunk. Bald Eagle is, is, his, is his nickname, and he's this gigantic gentleman who is, uh, we'll say, follically challenged. It's time to get on with it now, man. Just this huge, booming character. And when Major Kunk came down on somebody, you knew it. It was called getting kunked. Are there any questions? And he would do it occasionally, because Major Kunk was also an NCO, and he knows from soup to nuts what goes on in the military. And he came up with his nicknames for, for Jay and, and me. Jay was Snoop Dogg. And Dom was Top Gun. So we were commonly referred to by our nicknames. Well, it was early March when we finally got word. The process itself was pretty much a, a marathon. You go through and you get the vaccinations, you get the smallpox, you get the anthrax. It was a very, very long day. And uh, at one point, late in the day, we were sitting in this uh, basketball gymnasium, just a couple hundred of us, killing time. And I looked over and here's one soldier who had his Game Boy out. You know, he came prepared, man. He knew that it was gonna be a while. I have to admit, I kind of dreaded the flight over because I've spent a lot of time in the military and in military cargo planes, sitting in the back in these little sling seats. It was not what I expected. It was luxury. We took a 747, and the flight crew was exceedingly supportive and friendly. The stewardesses started taking pictures with the weapons of the guy. First it was pistols, and then it was 240 Bravos. They had the helmets on. It was really fun. There you go. They made the day for the soldiers. They were so fun and so playful and so nice to these guys. They really made it a, a terrific trip. The Army is nothing if not uh, a monster of protocol. Uh, we went to orientation um, at uh, Camp Doha, uh, got, got our specific orders straightened out, and uh, we're there for a very short time, and then we got trucked out to Camp New York, out in the desert. Camp New York was hey, a very well set up camp. There were shower units, we had a mess hall. We were getting two hots and a cot at Camp New York. It was pretty easy living. But one of the things that happened at Camp New York is the waiting game again. Is this the hard part, just waiting for things to happen? Always is, sitting around. When we hit the ground, they had no way of knowing how quickly this war would start. They expected it to start in a, in a couple weeks. Put it up. 
20 miles from the Iraqi border, soldiers conducted live fire drills today. This is a camp on a war footing, with missile bunkers at the ready and gas masks within reach every moment. The soldiers say they're ready for war, but the brigade is not. Not yet. That's because their vehicles and the larger weaponry haven't arrived here yet. The ship carrying them isn't due into port until March 18th. We've got the basic package for the light infantry. The issue would be the additional firepower and the mobility. So the, organically, it kind of concerns me, but I think we're, you know, we're within days of making that happen. They could have gone in as light infantry from the very start. They were prepared to do that. But they didn't have their Humvees and their helicopters and, and the, uh, the big weaponry that they use. Uh, those were still on a ship heading in port. So it became a watch and wait situation. And I remember after a couple weeks we were there, um, the sandstorms started up. Don, I think you were the first person, but the first of many to tell us today that we had a monster sandstorm coming along. When and where? Do you know precisely? We do not know precisely, although they are predicting uh, by about 10 a.m. tomorrow local time, Kuwait, Iraq time, is when it's expected. The, uh, the temperature is dropping precipitously right now as I speak, and the winds are, are definitely kicking up. The sandstorms, as anyone who witnessed it will tell you, were not of this world. And I've been in sandstorms in Afghanistan and in Kuwait and other places like that. The Shamal winds roared into Kuwait this morning, giving us one heck of a sandstorm, making it that much more difficult for the men and women who live and work here in the desert. There was so much sand still coming in the tent that Don was wrapped completely in a scarf around his head, goggles on, mouth covered up. Inside his sleeping bag, he looked like a mummy within about 10 minutes, just covered with fine layer of sand. You can see why that part of the world is where a lot of the great religions were developed because you can see there's good and evil and the, the forces of nature are out there. It was, it was pretty wild to see. Get your mask on. The first scuttle alert happened at night and everyone was trained, you put your mask on, you head into the bunkers. One minute, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Brooke was trying on his protective gear. The next minute, he was using it. Part of the brigade had just made it back to camp with the heavy equipment they were supposed to be preparing for combat when the air raid sirens went off. They ran for the bunkers and squeezed in. What the hell's this? As his men huddled in their cramped shelters, Colonel Brooke went bunker to bunker to make sure they were okay. We're going to take care of each other now. Chemical detectors have been placed around the camp within moments of the alert. They registered no gas. Oh, check you out. 30 minutes later, the all clear was given. You know, my concern is them getting a, because uh, not everybody's maybe taking the same uh, vigilance, reacting the same way. I'm trying to make sure they don't uh, fall into bad habits. He needn't have worried. Vigilance was the order of the day. It just began to wear on people. I hope you got some sleep, Don. And can you tell me what the situation is right now with the 101st Airborne? Well, unfortunately, there's not many people here getting any sleep, uh, mainly because we're getting air raid sirens going off about on the hour. Go to bed, and the sirens would start. So you have to get up, put your mask on, stumble out, sit in the bunker for 30 minutes or so until it's all clear, then stumble back, go back to bed, try to get some sleep. The real problem with the air raid has been a, a major disruption of the schedule to refit this equipment, and there is some concern that they might be behind schedule because of that. The day that General Wallace came was straight out of Patton's autobiography, I think. It, he's a larger-than-life character. Lieutenant General William S. Wallace.